So now we're going to turn it over to our speakers um, to tell, they're gonna tell you a little bit about themselves and go into uh, their discussion. And I'm greatly looking forward to the, the content. Hopefully you guys are too. So I'll, I'll let our speakers take it away. All right, well, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Lauren, for having us today and to all of um, Beyond for asking us to come and share our expertise with you. We're really excited to talk to you today. Um, let me see, here we go. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about cognitive fatigue and even touching upon um, sleep issues a little bit uh, with brain injury. I am a speech pathologist and I consider myself a neurocognitive specialist. I've worked for over 20 years in the field with all ages um, and I really, really love uh, working with people returning to um, work and just functional, being functional in life. I lived in Northern California for 20 years before moving to Raleigh a couple of years ago, and I partnered with Dr. DeCrecio, and we are here in Wake Forest and have a concussion clinic called Carolina Concussion, and um, things have been going really well, and we enjoy working together and find that our methods really uh, work well together for a very comprehensive way to, to deal with um, rehabilitation with brain injuries and concussions. So let's talk about cognitive fatigue and what is it? It's brain fatigue. It's different than your physical body fatigue, right? Everyone gets tired, but when you are a brain injury survivor, the fatigue is very different. And for those of us, that work with people um, that have brain injuries or concussions and or those that have them, we all kind of understand the difference, right? So I like to describe it to my clients that the brain is a muscle and your muscle of the brain, just like the bicep, if you're lifting a 20 pound weight for you know, a couple minutes, your bicep is going to get tired. And when your brain is thinking, it's just like lifting a weight. So I use a couple additional analogies with fatigue where if you can picture cogwheels and how those cogwheels are moving smoothly around and around, and then all of a sudden they can slow down and even walk up um, and get to the point that I call kind of the wall where those cogwheels lock up and then you just can't think anymore. So Right now, I want you to just stop and think about whether you're a professional working with those that have um, brain injuries or whether you're a survivor yourself. What are those symptoms that you see either with your clients or yourself when you know your brain is starting to get tired? Is it that your vision goes, your thinking slows down, you get a headache, you get irritable, lights bother you, noise bothers you. There are so many different symptoms that are available. Here's some more. Um, not everybody has all these symptoms all the time. It's really individual to each survivor, right? Some people feel nauseous. Some people have problems with finding words, being impulsive. One of my favorites is tired eyes. When, you're, when their eyes look tired, I have a mirror in my office and sometimes ask people to look in the mirror and ask themselves, do you look tired? Right? You have trouble remembering things. So it's individual to each individual that has had a brain injury or a concussion. I use a cognitive fatigue scale, a brain fatigue scale with my clients as a way to really measure where they're, where they're feeling. So when you're looking at this scale, we're going to start on the level one, fresh as a daisy, like it's Christmas morning, you wake up and you're not tired. And this is something that, you know, for those of you that have had a brain injury. 
before the brain injury when you would wake up and feel really, really good. That's what a level one is. Level two is when you're a little tired, but you can still get up and get through the day. Level three is when you're tired, but you can still work. So I like to give the example of in the afternoon, after you've had lunch where everyone's, you know, feels a little bit slower, but you can still really work. And level four is I'm tired, but I need a rest. So a healthy brain will be able to work on this fatigue scale of one through four, right? A four might be when you're tired and you're going to bed, or a four could be when you get home after work and you wanna take a little 20 minute cat nap because you're gonna to go to the movies or, or out, out, for, out for a night with some friends. The difference with a healthy brain and a brain that has had a brain injury is this level level five here where you pushed it past the point of being tired and your brain is overtired, right? So if, if your brain is a four, you take a rest and that rest, even if it's like a cat nap, right? Or you go to sleep for the evening, and wake up in the morning. When you wake up, you move down the scale to the left where you're, you'll get down to a two or a one. When someone has had a brain injury and their brain is too, too tired and you see those symptoms come on where all of a sudden you're having trouble remembering or you're getting irritated or noises are bothering you. When you are past that level four and you do take a rest, it takes a long time when you're a level five to move back down that scale. And most of the time after someone has had a brain injury or a concussion and they're suffering from post-concussion syndrome, they'll get stuck in just that four to five fatigue levels where they'll be a five and when they rest and wake up, even if it is overnight, they'll still wake up and have symptoms and feel like a level four. So one of the things we really try to do is, is focus on what are your symptoms when you are a level four. Now, to be clear, a level three is where you don't have any of those cognitive fatigue symptoms. A level four would be where they would start to sit in. So what I ask my clients to do is really work to try and stop when they're a level four and take a rest to try to get themselves farther down the scale. So one more time, now that you've heard me talking, where do you feel like you might be on the scale? Are you a little tired? Uh, if you have symptoms of cognitive fatigue, like is, if you have a headache, is it getting worse? Are you moving up the scale? So being aware of where you are on the scale and knowing when your particular symptoms set in and when you need to rest is a really important factor in the brain injury recovery. Because if you are functioning between a level four and five, you're kind of working behind the fatigue. So think about, have you ever heard the term like when someone has had surgery and they get behind the pain um, and then it takes them a while to get back. If you're having a lot of symptoms and it seems like they're always there, then you're probably behind the fatigue. And being behind the fatigue can really trigger many, many symptoms. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about, um, this is someone that I worked with actually in California, and he had a severe, pretty severe brain injury. His name's Trevor, and he has given me permission to talk to you guys a little bit about his story. Um, so when Trevor and I first started working together, you can see on the left, like he definitely did not feel 
fresh as a daisy. And I think, you know, even still to this day, it's a few years later, this is just a level that that he hasn't gotten to yet. It's really, really difficult. Level two, little tired. At the time that I met him, this was a goal for him. He was not able to get to a level two. But if you look over at nine months later, when he was a little tired, he had signs that he knew like, oh, I'm in a good place. You know, my voice works, my swallow is okay. He was, he could move his body easily. He didn't have tired eyes. His eyes were bright. He had expression on his face and he was able to respond, um, you know, in a reasonable time frame. So then again, if you compare like his level threes, when he, at the start of therapy, he would kind of lose his voice, actually, his ability to turn his voice on. His speech intelligibility was not very good, had some blurry vision, not the blurry vision. Um, and you can see some of those signs over there at the start of his therapy. Nine months later, his level three had improved. You know, his, his voice worked. He could move his body. That was something that he still had some slower response times. But again, um, you know, these things were all improving because he was gaining some cognitive stamina because he would stop better nine months into therapy and not make himself so overtired. So this is really the key area when you're looking at cognitive fatigue. When you are a level four, whatever symptoms you're having, when you do take a rest, it should move you back down, you could see at the top, to a level two or three after you take a rest. And I just want to show you the difference here for Trevor and his signs of fatigue. So when we first started working together and he had symptoms at that level of four and needed a rest. His rest really took him 15 to 30 minutes to bring him back down to a level two or three. And nine months later when he would take a rest, not only were his, his symptoms better, he had more stamina overall, but his rest, he didn't even need as long of a rest. It was only five to 15 minutes of quiet, and then he would be able to work, work again with us. So one of the good things about Trevor is now he really doesn't get to that level five, unless he really does something like go on a fishing trip or something. Um, when Trevor would hit this level five, he could take a nap, or rest or sleep all night and he would not get down back down to a level two or three and so we would call this uh we call it a, a fatigue hangover and think about your clients or for those of you that are brain injury survivors are there times where you've you've had a big day maybe lots of doctor's appointments or you travel somewhere and you come home and you rest and you wake up the next day and you just still feel exhausted and your symptoms are there. That's what I call that fatigue hangover. You've kind of overdone it. You've, you've gone to that level five, pushed it too much and you've hit the wall. That's why paying attention to when your symptoms are increasing in your level four and stopping and recovering down to a level two and three is important because hitting that level five and taking a long time to get back down the scale um, really slows down your recovery and definitely hinders your building up of cognitive stamina for your rehabilitation overall. So just a quick little review of some ways and suggestions for you to start working on this on your own. So talk together with 
those people that are in your life that recognize what symptoms that you have and you know create a list of what symptoms that you see when you're a level three yeah i mean sorry a level four so if you list them and you're able to talk about them about what level you're on you can say i'm a level four i need to go lay down if you are a caregiver of someone with a brain injury you can recognize their symptoms and point them out and help them gain insight to the symptoms and when they should be resting. So here's a quick little uh, tracking scale fatigue sheet. You can kind of take a quick look where I have people write down, you know, how did you feel in the morning? And you can see here at night at 10 o'clock, a person felt like a four when they went to bed. When they woke up in the morning, they were still a four. I would consider that a little bit of a cognitive fatigue hangover. So it really helps to get the data on paper so you can take a good look at it and try and adjust your day. Write down some symptoms, um, it helps. I talked briefly about resting. Um, the best kind of rest is taking a nap with a sleep, right? No stimuli there, your brain's really getting a good rest. The next level will be resting without stimuli, no TV, no music, no phone or computer. Um, that's like, you know, when you're, your brain is being stimulated, it's like lifting weights for it. Um, next level would be resting with the stimuli and the top level would just be switching tasks. You know, sometimes when you're doing some work and you think, well, I'm feeling a little tired, so instead of this paperwork, I'll make some phone calls. It's a version of a rest, but um, you know, early on in in a brain injury recovery, most of the time that's not going to cut it. You're really going to need a nap, or you're going to need to rest with that stimuli. So practicing resting to massive of energy is really important. Um, you can start doing it really structured and in therapy, and then kind of push levels by going out and you know, going to get a coffee and trying to pay attention specifically to when am I starting to get symptoms and when should I stop and really work up to, you know, much harder things like going away on the weekend and traveling. So one of the benefits, the big picture, you're able to work smarter and work longer. Tracking this kind of stuff is really helpful because it works on planning skills, it helps to improve your executive function. And I like to say that, um, you know, you need to falter safely to increase your awareness um, that your these these fatigue symptoms are happening. Um, when you when you aren't recognizing that these symptoms are there, it's how can you pay attention to them and stop and take a rest? So one of the main, main points I want you to get today is this one on the bottom. Functioning between that cognitive fatigue level four to five, it really does slow down TBI recovery because you're in recovery mode instead of being able to be in the mode where you're building up stamina. So to talk briefly about fatigue and sleeping, um, your, your brain is healing when it's sleeping. Um, the basics of sleep, right? A consistent bedtime, wake time, sleep routine is important. Limiting your nap time um, is, is also important. Medications may be warranted, but please work with your doctors. Track with your fatigue level. You can just write a sheet out sort of like the one that I had showed you, use the data to help you understand if you need to change how you're sleeping. If you're napping too much where you can't sleep at night, you might need to add some exercise. Um, I've really noticed that people, their sleeping improves a lot when their brain fatigue and their physical body fatigue are most closely matched when trying to fall asleep. If you've taken naps all day long and your body isn't physically tired, it seems to make it a lot harder to fall asleep. So with fatigue and sleep, some suggestions I give my clients are some mindfulness, 
meditation techniques before bed. Um, there's there are three things. The Love Your Brain Foundation has some uh, free meditation um, programs that you can use. The Pranayama app is just some basic breathing and the Headspace app has a free program that is also really helpful to kind of help slow your brain down if you're having racing brain as a symptom and it's difficult, making it difficult for you to fall asleep. And finally, some potential work suggestions. I almost never recommend just going straight back to work. It's, it's a lot for your brain. Um, I like to scaffold my return to work. Every stage of returning to work, this is really important, often feels like a setback. Um, you take one step forward and it's harder and your brain gets fatigued. And then you have to learn how to manage working kind of at that level. Um, so, and, and come up with strategies sometimes too, to minimize your fatigue. Here is a little sample plan of going back to work. Sometimes I will make sure that everybody, when they go back, they have so many hours, but that they have enough time in the afternoon and maybe even a day in between to really fully recover. If you go to work and you work for four hours and by the time you get home, you are a five and you your symptoms are very strong and it takes you a day to recover just from working for four hours, which is a very reasonable thing that I often see when people go back to work. Um, having that time in between to recover to get back down to a two or three to go back to work again um, really gives people what they need. If they don't have that break, then the symptoms can start to stack on top of one another and you can, and um, people can end up right back kind of where they started with the fatigue being behind the fatigue. So my final considerations are communication is key. When you are either a caregiver or you have a brain injury yourself, telling people what's going on and what you need. You need lots of breaks. You know, when you do have fatigue and symptoms set in, you need to stop. Powering through and pushing through is not helpful for you. It's actually detrimental and will slow down the recovery. Um, it's hard when this is something that people can't see. They think because you can talk and they can have conversations with you. Um, they can't see what's going on with your brain. So you really need to communicate how you're feeling and explain what you need. And listen to the people that are your caregivers. They may be able to see things and have insight that you don't have, um, that you wanna work towards having on your own. But if you don't know that you're having symptoms, say irritability, um, or that you're forgetting things, it's going to make it that much more difficult for you to become aware of them. So listen to the people that care about you and, and try to recognize that what they're saying might be true. You'll see that I've um, put on here a link. I wrote an article which actually explains all of this very clearly. <laughs> so if you're feel, feeling fatigued and you feel like this is something that you would like to renew on your own, you can go to that article link and, and print it out and review everything in your own time. So if you have any questions, write them down and hopefully at the end, we'll have enough time for Dr. DeCrecio and I to answer them. All right, so here's Dr. DeCrecio. Good afternoon, everyone. I knew I should have went first. But, um, again, like uh, Lauren, uh, thanks so much for having us, as Janine said. Um, thanks to everyone for taking the time out of their day to, you know, learn a little bit about, um, you know, more about concussions and, and what you can do and what's available. Um, I want to talk more about the rehab portion, um, vestibular rehab portion of concussions and um, some fall prevention as well, too. Uh, try to leave um, definitely some time for, for some questions. 
um, that you may have. A little bit about myself. Um, my background is actually in chiropractic, but most of my training occurred after school, um, postgraduate in vestibular rehab, uh, as far as being board certified, and then um, more education on concussions. In uh, 2010, I had a practice in Maryland called Center for Dizziness and Balance Disorders, where I worked with physical therapists. Um, we treated all sorts of vestibular disorders, um, concussions being one of them. And in 2017, we were acquired um, by a hospital that I still work with and consult um, with their physical therapist weekly and their concussion team. And in 2017, we um, opened up Carolina Concussion and Physical Medicine and had the pleasure of working with Janine since 2018. And, you know, just before I forget to say this, when I was working in Maryland, it was just myself and physical therapists. We did not have cognitive rehabilitation. And what I've found since working here um, with Janine that it helps my patients so much more because I never realized the fatigue that would set in when I'm trying to work with them in rehab that would actually slow down our practice or almost, as Janine said, you know, they would hit a wall. So what I found is in the combination, as she said comprehensively, it certainly helps um, my patients um, recover quicker. So why are brain injuries so misunderstood? And I put that title up because I have a lot of patients that come in and whether it be the parents or uh, the patient themselves and say, well, I didn't lose consciousness, so I don't think it's that bad. Or, you know, I didn't hit my head, so, you know, I, I don't think I have a concussion. And what a lot do not realize of the different components of a concussion injury. So if you look at this chart, and if you've suffered a concussion, if you're a survivor, um, a lot of these may be familiar to you. But there's basically three parts. This has four if you count sleep. But typically, we talk about three components of a concussion. So there's the physical component, which I work a lot with. And if you look at that on the left side, um, you can see dizziness, um, balance issues, which we'll talk about, um, blurred, blurred vision, headache is a big one. Um, Jean talked about low energy level, fatigue, um, light sensitivity. There's a lot of, I mean, and, and there's more symptoms than this, but this is the, the most common ones, which we'll talk about. And then as Janine talked about, um, there's the cognitive side, um, the mental fogginess, the um, difficult to concentrate, um, confusion, um, fatigue's definitely in there as well too. Um, sleep, Janine also talked about, you might sleep too much you might sleep too little. Um, either one is not the greatest for you. And then uh, I actually had a patient today where he was a three-year-old who fell out of a, a cart and had a concussion. And his mom noticed from that day forward that he had a lot of aggression, a lot of irritability, and said, basically, this isn't you know, my son. And she'd go to doctors and they wouldn't, they wouldn't relate that the concussion would actually change a, a behavior in somebody. But if you look at this component, you can see with a concussion injury that it can affect, you know, your mood. It can affect, um, it can make you depressed. It can make you feel really agitated about things that normally wouldn't make you agitated. Um, there's something called a, a being liable where, um, you know, you might cry more than you should or, or laugh harder than you really should. And it's not the appropriate responses um, to stimuli. So when we're looking at a concussion patient, you really want to look at all of these components. And if you've suffered yourself, you know, you might be able to relate some of your symptoms um, to your injury and, and it's not something, something else. So this is just a good chart just to kind of look at, at comprehensively of all the damaging effects that a, a concussion could have for somebody. So we talked about some of the symptoms on that chart, but um, they've researched kind of what, what most uh, commonly some of the headaches could be, uh, headaches, because some of the symptoms could be. Headache is number one. Um, most of my patients, that's going to be one of the symptoms that they're going to write down or, or relate to me when um, they come in on their first visit. Um, Percentage-wise, you know, I don't know, you know, if, 
if this is you know across the board but this is something that at least kind of gives you an idea of how common some things compared to others would be um, most patients have all of these at once so it's not that they just have one or two sometimes that's the case but a lot of times it's uh, multifactorial they'll, they'll have a lot of these all, all at once um, especially with the you know the higher grades of a concussion so headache you know if you have a headache it's very hard to have a good day um, it's hard to tolerate certain things um, whether it be through family whether it be when we're doing rehab um, so we definitely want to try to get that down as much as possible um, dizziness you can see it's the number four four down there that's 55 percent and they've done studies to show that dizziness if you have that as a symptom following a concussion that's the number one uh, indicator for a prolonged recovery so if that's one of your symptoms doesn't mean it's going to take longer than than it would have but it's a probability that it that it could um fatigue they had it at 50 percent i'm not sure if janine agrees with that mm -hmm. I think that's higher in our experience with the patients that we see. Um, you know, things that shouldn't fatigue them. I I relate to, to patients um, when dealing with this as a boiling point. So if you have water and you're going to boil it, there's a certain point that it's going to it's going to boil. Uh, I relate that to patient symptoms. So if a patient and their tolerance. So if a patient has a low tolerance, their boiling point's low it doesn't take much for them to feel symptoms. So what we try to do is increase that tolerance, increase that boiling point, so that normal things that they should be able to do day to day um, won't fatigue them and won't cause symptoms. So that, that's kind of the goal. Um, blurred vision, double vision, I'm gonna talk about that with an example of a vestibular exercise. But basically what that is, is that a patient, they cannot see a target clearly because their eyes aren't stable on it. So whether it be that they just can't focus on it or with movement of their head, their eyes aren't staying stable on it. And I'll show you an example of that as far as an, an exercise. The toughest symptom that we see here is probably light sensitivity. Um, they call that photophobia. And it's very difficult um, to work with because they have to wear sunglasses, um, different types of light, computer screens, there's, there's different ways you can help with that. But that symptom I usually see take longer to heal than the other symptoms you see on that list. Um, memory dysfunction, which Janine works a lot with, and then balance problems we're actually gonna talk about today um, on a few slides from now, because as Lauren said, you know, falls are a big problem with either when you have a head injury and your balance isn't good and you can sustain another head injury, or you have a balance issue and it causes a concussion or a head injury. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So not to get in too much detail, but what is going on inside when a concussion exists? So what is going on with the nerves, with the brain? What is producing some of these symptoms? And without getting into too much detail, if you look in the top right, um, that's a, a picture of a, of a neuron. And so there's different components of that. And the one thing I want you to look at is where you see on the top right where it says node of Ramvier and there's myelin sheaths. And those two components of the axon basically make the signal, think of like electricity, it makes the signal go quicker. So if you look below, when you have a concussion injury, it's not as simple as you just hit your head and your brain just kind of moves a bit. A lot of times with an injury, there's what they call a shearing motion. So it's not a straight linear front to back or side to side. The brain can actually twist. And when that happens, the neurons can stretch and it creates a whole cascade of, of issues um, mechanically and chemically, but they can stretch, they can tear, um, and you're losing that signal. So if you have these myelin sheaths and nodes of Ramvier to increase the signal, and now you lose them, the signals that normally will get to areas of the brain can't get there. And so that's what we're trying to work with and kind of reintegrate new neurons and new pathways to rehab. And you've probably heard the term before called plasticity, and that, that's really what it is. We're, we're trying to um, create better pathways for what's um, been injured. 
this is, you know, when Jeanine talks about, you know, rest and, you know, especially the first seven days following a concussion, they've done studies to show what's happening metabolically. And without getting again into too much detail, you're losing about 30% of your blood flow after a head injury. So what happens is your body's trying to, it, it needs more glucose, it needs more energy, but there's less going to the areas and to the cells and to the neurons. And so in the beginning, rest is really the best thing you can do because you're not, you don't think of, I tell patients, you know, if you have a car and you have a low tank of gas, the last thing you want to do is go ride for, you know, a hundred miles. So you really want to rest and kind of let this cycle, because you can see as the days go on at that top, um, you'll start to, to minimize that, it's called a metabolic crisis. So your blood flow won't be restricted as much. You're not going to demand for glucose as much and your body will be able to create some energy a little bit better. So typically right after an injury, um, I try not to do too much with the patient because they really need to rest and um, let the inflammation go down. Um, and there's a whole, this is very simplistic of what's really happening met metabolically. Um, but this just give you, gives you an idea of, you know, why you want to rest after an injury because your, your, your brain, your, your cells are not functioning the way they should. So to talk about the vestibular system, some of you may have heard about this before, maybe not, but I relate this as, as parts of a car. So in a car, there's an engine that, that makes things run, but there's different components. And there's three main components when it comes to the vestibular system that we look at very closely. And sometimes one of the three isn't working right, sometimes two of the three, and unfortunately, sometimes three of the three are not functioning properly. And um, it's, it's a very complex system, but I'm gonna break it down just to give you an idea of the three main components of it. So the first one is the central vestibular system, and that's your brain and your eyes. And I equate that to like the, a computer processor. So every stimuli you, you sense, you see, you feel, um, relates into that central vestibular system, and it has to process. And then once it processes, it has to send signals back out, whether it be to the eyes, down to the feet for balance. So it's a very important part of the vestibular system. And unfortunately with concussions, that's one of the main parts of the system that gets affected um, because it is your brain and your eyes. The second component is your peripheral vestibular system. And think of your, your inner ear and not the part where, you know, if a doctor looks in your ear and they kind of look at your eardrum, it's deep beyond that into the temporal bone, and that's called your peripheral vestibular system. And that, I, I tell patients, it's like your motion sensor. So when you move, your inner ear has to tell your eyes and your brain where you are in space at that moment, whether you're looking down, up. And if those signals are not proper, whether it be there's a concussion in the peripheral system, it's called a labyrinthine concussion, or that signal is getting to the central vestibular system, but it can't process it. Either one creates a problem for the patient, it can cause dizziness, vertigo, um, balance issues, headaches, you name it, especially the symptoms we saw earlier on. Um, these are what we wanna focus on to get those symptoms better. And then the third part of the system is called proprioception. And all that means is you have sensors in your skin and your muscles and your joints, and they tell you where you are in space. Uh, a good example of that would be if you know somebody who has diabetic neuropathy or just neuropathy where they can't feel the floor, um, chances are they're probably gonna have some, some balance issues because they're not getting that signal up to the brain to be processed. Um, so the nice thing about this system is if one of the areas is not functioning right or permanently injured, you can enhance the other two to compensate. It's called substitution. Um, so that's, that's one thing we do quite a bit, which helps a lot of patients. Um, so everything that, you know, you're seeing on that one, two, and three list um, provides information to the brain about where you are in space relative to your environment. And if everything's working properly, you know where you are, you're able to kind of move through the world, and your balance is probably pretty good as well, too, without any symptoms. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the diagnostics that 
um, is available because I have a case study at the end that um, we used some of these and I just want to kind of have you have a little background on it. So if you look to the left, there's something called VMG. And what this is, is it looks at the visual systems and looks at that central vestibular system that we just saw on the slide before. And it's tracking how quick your eyes are moving, how accurate. Um, it's looking at all different trackings and seeing, you know, if you're on target, if you're off target. And typically when you're when there's something going on with that, that you're gonna have the symptoms of, some patients have symptoms during the test. Um, but, you know, when they talk about concussions being an invisible injury, um, sometimes these testings can help kind of bring out, you know, the impairments as well too. The second uh, test is called a D2, it's a visiomotor. So it's basically looking at how quick the eyes and the brain can tell the, the hands how to react and how fast to, to go to the target and how accurate it can be. Um, we can also throw cognitive components in this as well too in that blue screen in the middle. And then the last part is a computerized balance test and we use that based on the patient's age and height um, to see if they're swaying, to see you know if they're, um, balance is different in different systems, whether it be their eyes are closed or as you can see, she's standing on foam. Um, so these are just some, some tests that I'll, I wanna go over when we do the uh, case study. So let's talk about balance and, and head trauma. So statistically between 30 and 65% of individuals um, with TBI suffer from dizziness and lack of balance. And as you can see, if you're dizzy, your balance is probably not gonna be good. Um, and so balance is really what I tell patients is the end product of how your brain's actually functioning. So they call that a biomarker. So we look at balance as kind of an indirect way to see how other areas are, are working. Um, and we can track that as far as with progress. So some common causes of balance problems are obviously problems with vision. If you're not able to see uh, you know, around you, whether it be double, or if you have what they call a hemi neglect where you, you can't see a lot in the periphery, um, you might make a quick turn and, and fall. Uh, we talked about the peripheral vestibular system. So number two is the inner ear. Um, whether you have an ear infection, if you have a, a concussion of the inner ear, um, that can create vertigo, um, dizziness. And just to kind of define it, a lot of uh, people confuse vertigo with dizziness. So vertigo is a spinning sensation. So either you feel like you're spinning and everything's still around you, or you're still and the surround is spinning around you. So that's really vertigo. Um, and then dizziness is basically everything else, whether it be you know lightheaded, I feel off. Um, a big complaint with patients is I feel a floaty sensation in my head or like a mental fog type of, of issue with movements. Um, so either of these can cause problems with balance because again, the signal has to come from the brain and the inner ear down to the feet. And just like a phone line, if there's some static, it's not gonna get to the end uh, where it wants to go with the right signal. So um, we look at that very closely when it comes to balance. And some factors that determine, you know, maybe how bad, bad your balance would be. Um, one is how severe your brain injury is. Is it a concussion? Is it, is it a moderate TBI? Is it a severe TBI? You know, all of that plays into account. And even with a concussion, there's different grades of a concussion. Um, you know, did you lose consciousness? Did you have dizziness after? Um, so there's a lot of factors with that. Um, where in your brain you were injured. Um, if you have a, a frontal lobe injury, you're gonna have a different balance pattern than if you had a parietal or, you know, the side part of your brain. Um, so different areas of the brain will, will present with different symptoms and different clinical findings. And then have you had a previous history of head injuries? This is a very, very important one. Um, I found and we found with patients that if you've had multiple head injuries, and most importantly, if they've been close together, seems to be um, more detrimental as far as the, the symptoms and the, the recovery period as well too. Um, and then some medications, um, some sedatives, you know, if it's slowing down your brain, you're gonna slow down your reaction time. There is a medication called meclizine um, or antivert, and they use that when somebody has vertigo or dizziness. And the idea is it, it slows down the brain, um, so it slows down that spinning sensation, but 
if you ever look at the medication, one of the side effects is actually dizziness. So because you're slowing down your reaction time, you have a more um, probability of falling. So it's very important to talk with your doctor that if you are on some medications that are slowing down, whether it be Valium or you know different things that kind of slow your reaction time, you're at a higher risk for falls. So it's, it's important to know that um, so you're safe and, and you're not putting yourself in a situation where um, the potential is to fall. So real quick, what is vestibular rehab? And it's basically, a, it's, it's a specialized form of, of physical therapy that looks at those three parts we talked about, the central vestibular system, the peripheral and the proprioception, and basically targets with specific head, eye, body movements, um, custom to where the impairments are. And the idea is to decrease the symptoms by your basically what it's called habituation. You're desensitizing um, the problem. So you're making them do it in repetitions in a way that they can tolerate it, but also improves the overall vestibular system. Um, whether it be visual issues, whether it be balance, um, it's all basically you know the same system that you're going to be targeting. This is just an example of a vestibular rehab exercise, and this is called gaze stabilization. Um, it's the quickest reflex in the body. So when you're walking, for example, and you're walking and your head's moving up and down, the world's not moving up and down because your eyes are moving equal and opposite. So it's a seven and a half millisecond reaction time. So it's a very important exercise because if you don't have gaze stabilization, you're going to have blurred vision, dizziness, and definitely imbalance um, until that's corrected. So that's just an example um, of a vestibular exercise that a patient would do. And then some, some quick tips on, on falls. Um, you know, you've probably seen a lot of this before, but you want to keep anything loose around your house, basically, you wanna just examine everything and you wanna keep that away. So you don't want anything that you can trip over being out um, where you normally walk. Um, Non-slip mats are, mats are very good for patients that um, have some balance disorders or dizziness because they're not gonna slip and have to react quickly. Um, dark definitely affects your, your peripheral system that has to work harder. So using night lights, if you have if you rely a lot on your vision, um, that will create some um, better balance for you. And then, you know, install some grab bars and handrails that if you're really unstable, that you have some, some use for that. Um, obviously, I don't have on here, but, if, you know, canes, walkers, things like that. Anything that can give you more balance um, is what you'd like to do. Um, this is real quick. I'm going to leave it open for some questions. But um, this is a patient both Janine and I saw. Um, his name is Courtney. And he was rear-ended by uh, a car going about 50 miles per hour. Um, we saw him two weeks after the injury. And he also had, like I talked about, he had some multiple concussions prior to this uh, concussion, concussion that we saw him for. His symptoms are below. Um, so like I said, you know, if you look at that list I had before, most patients have it all. Um, I think he pretty much had it all. And so um, this is kind of where he started. Um, his reaction time, just to show you, was about 1.62 seconds on the D2. Normal should be 0.8. And he's a healthy guy before all this, so he definitely, and, and an athlete, so he should be able to definitely do under 0.8. Um, the targets that we looked at, um, he had an increased headache. He was all over the place, couldn't follow it, um, and in the dark caused dizziness as well. His balance, he kept falling to his left, especially with standing on foam. And so what we did was we just targeted those areas. Um, we used vestibular rehab. He did cognitive rehab as well. Um, he was able, unable to work for about two months. And this is, you know, a typical patient. Um, to the left is where we started. To the right um, was after his reaction time went down to 0.7 instead of 1.62. Um, cognitive function. He was able to tolerate. We talked about that boiling point. Um, we got that up that he could pretty much do anything he wanted and um, not have symptoms um, after that. He was lucky we got to him, you know, about two weeks after the injury. So he wasn't in that post-concussion syndrome um, as well. So again, we want to thank you for having us. Um, any questions, any um, additional information you'd like, um, if you're a professional and you want more details, um, I definitely have slides for that as well, too. Um, but if you're a survivor and have some, some questions, please feel free to reach out to us, whether it be our website, email. Um, 
or, or give us a call. And I'd like to open it up, we'd like to open up for questions. Thank you so much. That was a, a just so much uh, great information for, and then relating it back to, to falls is, is so important, particularly during this week, but really all the time. Um, we have a, a question. So obviously it's been said that like, like, napping too much is, um, and this is mainly for Janine and, and related mm -hmm. to cognitive fatigue. Um, you know, napping is, is obviously bad too much of it because it affects sleep. Um, is that what you mentioned exercise uh, being a good counter for that? But is there another, is there a, a sweet spot in terms of napping too much, too little, et cetera? Well, it really, it, it really varies on the individual. And not only that, but as you are moving through your recovery, it, it will continue to vary. You know, like at sometimes I'm working with people and at the beginning, of um, the first couple of weeks, they might nap two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. And then as they start to gain more stamina, that's too long. They won't be able to sleep at night. So it really, it really is something where you have to be paying attention to and having good awareness on um, is, your, is, your, is your body tired? And there are other ways to um, try and minimize stimuli. So, you know, resting without stimuli is really important, but you can also try and do things like, you know, if wear earplugs, um, go out for a walk, but have earplugs in um, as long as you're on a sidewalk and you're safe or walk on a treadmill and have a hat as well as sunglasses to really decrease the amount of stimuli that your brain is getting while at the same time letting your body get the exercise so it can be fatigued as well. So, you know, it's kind of um, problem solving and in implementing some strategies that will work for the individual for where they are in their recovery. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, uh, so what, uh, and this is to you, Dr. DiCrisio, um, what is the estimated length of treatment with vestibular therapy for typical post-concussion syndrome? Uh, that's a tough question I get every week. Um, <laughs> it really varies. There's so many variables. Um, you know, look back to, you know, think of some of the older slides that I did. Um, what are the symptoms? How many concussions have they had? Um, you know, how compliant really is a patient because some of the treatment they're doing at home as well, as far as the repetitions of exercises. But on average, um, if you're talking about a concussion, um, it can be anywhere from, you know, a few months to half a year. Um, if it's just a dizziness problem, it's not from a concussion, um, probably, you know, a few months usually. Okay. And do you see a difference typically with rehabilitation if someone is longer out of their, like, since their brain injury? Do you see a difference between someone that's, like, right as soon as, they have the injury, you know, they contact you and they get uh, support versus, you know, it's been a couple of years or it's more severe injury or something? Um, you know, the brain's pretty amazing. So, you know, even if it's a post-concussion syndrome or if it's been, you know, several years, um, those are the patients we actually see quite a bit, especially when I was in Maryland. Um, so it's just a matter of kind of, you know, stimulating the areas again and getting things working better. Um, but yeah, obviously, if a patient's only a couple of weeks out, um, they might recover a little quicker. Um, age is a big factor. You know, I have a lot of high school kids, and it's amazing. From one week, it's like they look like two different people. Um, but the older patients, when I say older, I mean anybody from really 25 to 30 on, um, sometimes takes a little bit longer to get, you know, you, you're going to see results each week, but it's maybe not as quickly. And from the, from the cognitive fatigue perspective, if they've been kind of functioning at that four to five fatigue level where they're really never without symptoms, honestly, what happens is they um, can, when they, when they feel okay, <laughs> like just a four, they think I'm feeling pretty good and then they do more. So they're kind of in the habit and forget what it feels like to not have symptoms. So it, sometimes they can take a little while to um, bring to get 
on the other side of that uh, cognitive fatigue and get down to where they're not feeling symptoms. And uh, oftentimes when people come in and are like, whoa, I don't have any symptoms. I forgot what this felt like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that that's definitely something that it, it's so individual to the person, but that fatigue is is so often affecting everything mm -hmm. that you're that you're doing in life. Um, at what point do you recommend initiating kind of cognitive therapy um, for someone after an injury? Well, we have have we talked about like Dr. DiCrisio talked about that first seven days of really just kind of resting. Um, if your symptoms have not gone away and cleared in a week, then that's when we really say, come in and see us before those symptoms really start to stack, you know, start working on it. Um, if they don't, if they haven't cleared in that time, they're, they're most likely not going to just clear on their own. They're going to really either linger for a long time or they're going to stack and just get exponentially worse. And what happens also is they'll compensate. And so it's almost like putting a bandaid on it. And what I've seen with patients is sometimes, you know, stress and fatigue can kind of what they call de decompensate and it kind of brings on the symptoms again or if they get another injury, now they're dealing with two injuries um, instead of just one. Um, so compensation can have the appearance so that everything's okay, but can regress over time as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Good, definitely good, uh, good thoughts there. Um, uh, one question we have is, you know, do you ever see teens with PTOS or, or postural orthostatic tachycardia cardio syndrome? Their symptoms are very similar to those with individuals with traumatic brain injury. And so wondering if, if that was something that was familiar or something that you've seen before. Are they talking about like POTS disease, perhaps? I mean, is that? Yeah. They said, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I've had uh, several patients with that. And they've had some studies to show that there's a link between the vestibular system and um, uh, heart rate and, and postural um, Basically, the vestibular system has to tell your heart kind of where you are, you know, whether you're laying down or sitting up. Um, and so I've had a few patients. Um, one was in high school, one was a little older, and it seemed to work quite well for them, but it's not going to be every patient. So it really just depends on how their system, you know, is functioning. Is there an impairment in the vestibular system? And then, you know, worst case scenario, we can get the vestibular system better. Question is, is it relating to you know, their, their postural um, orthostatic hypotension. Um, so it's just, I've had some success with it, but I can't say every patient that has that would get better with vestibular rehab though. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then uh, this is someone that, uh, that Bianca will probably reach out to too, just to make sure that we get them the resources. But do you know of anyone um, that in the Charlotte area that provides vestibular therapy for individuals? Um, not offhand, but I'd be happy to maybe research and kind of see what they do because, you know, there's a lot of clinics that do vestibular rehab, but you want one that, that is able to really cust customize to the patient, um, and have a lot of experience with, with concussions and vestibular rehab. Um, so I, I can certainly, you know, maybe do some research. I've only been here a couple of years, so I don't have a good handle of, you know, who's, out um, around this area, um, but I'm sure that we can probably find somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and I can say um, just from working with Dr. DiCrucio, I've been working for many years in rehabilitation settings with physical therapy and occupational therapy, and um, one of the things that I have really noticed is that the tools that he used to uses to assess um, the VNG and the D2 and the, the balance, um, the balance testing, it, it's objective. And so when he provides the exercises for like, say the eye exercises that you saw, it, it's at a level where it's right where someone needs to be working. And that's where like that fatigue comes in again, because if um, you need to work to the point of challenge, 
but not overdo it. And it's pretty tricky, but if the, but if the exercises are um, right at your level because there's objective measurements, it really makes all the difference in the world. Um, combining that with um, the fatigue and increasing the, uh, the awareness of fatigue and how to manage it and learning strategies that are individual um, for, for each person, um, I think that's what's made our approach so successful. Wonderful. All right. Well, that is unfortunately all the time that we have um, for today. Uh, so thankful for, for our speakers today and everyone that came with uh, questions and participated in the polls. There are handouts that you can download um, under the handout section so that will include the slides and things like that. Um, we will also have a record. This webinar has been recorded. So in your follow up email, you should get the recording of it. We'll also put it on our website for people that maybe were not able to attend are able to get the slides and the information at a later date. Um, again, you know, take a look at our, our website, bianc.net, B-I-A-N-C, for more information about activities, webinars, trainings, conferences, et cetera. And we look forward to seeing you guys at the next webinar. I hope you guys have a wonderful day.